This podcast includes information provided by the issuer and does not express the views of the interviewer. This podcast may also include forward-looking statements by the issuer that involve certain risks and uncertainties to its business. Because forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, the issuer's actual results could differ from those indicated in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T, and you are listening to episode 55. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rkraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you'd like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the Microcap message. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Siegfried Eggert. He is an analyst with geoinvesting.com. I met Siggy at a few conferences, and I wanted to learn more about his approach to Microcap investing. As you will hear, like Mark Vonderwell, he also looks at special situations. And we also discuss his article, and I quote, active versus passive investing, what it means and how active managers can compete, end quote. The goal for this episode is to learn more about active versus passive investing and Siggy's approach to special situation investing. I also want to give you all a heads up to mark your calendars for next year's Planet Microcap Showcase. We are hosting our annual event at the Planet Hollywood Resort and Casino in Las Vegas, April 24th through 26th, 2018. If you would like to attend, please go to www.planetmicrocapshowcase.com and click the registration tab for instructions. You won't want to miss it this year. Thank you again for tuning in to episode 55 of the Planet Microcap podcast. Please enjoy my interview with Siegfried Eggert, but first a word from our sponsor. Our House Grief Support Center provides the Los Angeles community with grief support services, education, and hope. This wonderful organization helped me immensely, and the Planet Microcap podcast is proud to support their upcoming event, The Night for Hope, on Friday, November 17th at the Palace Theater in downtown Los Angeles. Join the Our House Grief Support Center's Associate Board for a night of good friends and great laughs, featuring a lineup that includes some of LA's finest up-and-coming comedians. All money raised will benefit the Our House mission and continue to help the community in need. For more information, visit ourhouse-grief.org backslash hope tickets. I look forward to seeing you all there. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I have Siegfried Eggert on the program. He is an analyst with geoinvesting.com. Siegfried, welcome to the Planet Microcap podcast. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. So uh, to start off, let's get your background. And uh, and also, it's Siegfried or Siggy, right? Uh, Most people in the U.S. actually go with uh, Ziggy, and I'm okay with that. So... uh... (laughs) Even people back home call me Ziggy. So I was actually born and raised in Germany. Um, lived there for the first 19 years of my life. Um, I studied international business in the Netherlands. And I studied actually eight months as well in China and Beijing. Um, after that, I worked in investment banking in Vienna on the equity trading floor for some time. And uh, when the time came around for me to, to pursue graduate studies, uh, I didn't really consider the U.S., but uh, it so happened that I got a scholarship offer from a university in the US. Um, I came over, uh, did my master's degree here and uh, stayed here actually for work and started working at GeoInvesting and um, have been with the company for a little more than a year now and then uh, enjoyed very much. So how and why then did you start in looking at microcaps or investing in microcaps? Were you looking at it before you came to geo-investing or once you got to geo-investing, you started looking more into it? So uh, I've been looking into microcaps for quite a long time and I think it's fair to give you a little bit of a background on uh, how I got into investing, really. So um, in my first year of college, um, I saw Charlie Manga and uh, Warren Buffett speak on YouTube and for some reason, you know, that re- really resonated well with me. 
Um, and I kind of followed these principles and tried to learn more, tried to learn more about that and really got into investing. And from the very beginning, it made a lot of sense to me to uh, pick my spots very carefully. I understood that it doesn't make a lot of sense just because of the way that people compete to you know try to get an information advantage or anything uh, in the situations that you know everybody looks at and you know everybody kind of understands and I would be competing with um, you know armies of analysts who um, all have ex enormous experience and are in the business for a lot longer than me and track this specific company for a lot longer than I do. Um, so I always felt that I had to pick my spot very carefully if I wanted to compete in an investing business. Um, and it just made sense to me intuitively to start in the microcap space uh, as well because, um, you know, a lot of people are restricted from investing it just because of the amount of money that you can invest in the space. But um, most people don't start off with millions over millions of dollars and neither did I. So I was pretty happy looking for opportunities early on in the microcap space. So I've been doing that for over over four or five years now. So then you talk about wanting to have an advantage and not look for things in the same way. You know, does that also apply to your strategy when it comes to microcaps? Because I know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I did a little bit of background in, on your bio. You know, you have a specific way in which you look so, at a potential new microcap investment. Um, that's true. So um, it so happened that I got into more and more special situation analysis. Um, I guess special situation is doesn't really mean anything it's everything it doesn't really fit a uh, any other box right um and and just that just came about because in our research you know we came we just look at a lot of situations you know we we go through a lot of filings and try to understand what's going on and a lot of filings were handed on to me where people just you know it was hard to figure out what's going on so they just passed that on to me and said well ziggy you you're an accounting major figure out what's going on here read these filings thoroughly and um over time, you know, these very arcane and, and weird situations that were complex on the surface, when you really look into it, um, you know, there were, there were a couple of very interesting investment situations that revealed themselves over time. Mm. Um, and I think we can talk a little bit more about the specifics, what kind of situations that would be. Well, before we get into that, let's, let's um, I want to I understand a little bit more, you know, what, what do you look for in a potential you know, micro cap investment. What are some of your, what are some of the boxes you like to tick? Oh, I think there are, there are different buckets. Um, you know, what everybody l would love to, to own is, you know, what's best is owning a great growing business at a cheap price. So of course the holy grail is, um, you know, finding a young business that you really, really like, you like the management and you still like the valuation, invest in it and stay in it for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. it so happens that in practice it's, um, Oftentimes, not so obvious what the future of a company will be, and very seldomly you you know, I at least find the conviction to really say, okay, this is a company that I can bet on for you know five years without you know being worried, you know, because I feel so comfortable about management and the business and everything that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Besides that, uh, and that's something that I find you know harder and harder to find a business that is just fundamentally sound is growing and is, is cheap you know a lot of these businesses are especially in today's market not not cheap anymore um, so what we do more and more is look into special situations which means then you know something uh, out of the ordinary is going on uh, and there's something to be figured out here and 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 we try to you know get more and more into situations ar around that yeah. but if you talk about what do we generally look for we look for what most microcap investors look for which is a great company that's young has a great growth trajectory um, and i think by and large it would put us in the category of garp investing so growth at a reasonable price um, we like growing companies uh, at the same time we do pay attention to valuation and don't want to cra pay crazy multiples right so you, you talk we now talked about or you brought up special situations a couple times and you know, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you heard my interview with uh, with Mark uh, Vonderwell, aka Googie, yeah. and uh, you know, we talked about special situations. He kind of introduced us to this whole concept of special situations, and and we focused specifically on that interview in uh, in rights offerings. You know, so what what are some of the special situations that you focus on, and why? Um. So special situations are, you know, those that we look at are always just a little different. 
So uh, I wouldn't necessarily put them into, you know, different boxes, but I can give you cer certain things that we look for. Um, so, you know, I can't give you an exact science, but I might be able to give you somewhat of a map. So oftentimes it's around, um, you know, events. It's event driven, you know, M&A activity. Maybe there's an activist getting involved. Maybe there's an offering of a security, you know, like in the rights offering, which, you know, sparks our interest and we try to figure out what, what's going on. Um, another good hint to look for, you know, situations where you might may maybe have an opportunity uh, is if, if there's a big degree of uncertainty. Mm. The risk and uncertainty are not necessarily always the same thing. And, um, you know, if, if, if we can remove some of that uncertainty or maybe live with that uncertainty better than other investors can, um, you know, there might be an, a situation for us to look at. Um, also generally like stuff that's obscure and hard to figure out. That doesn't mean that we can figure out everything. You know, most of the things still come into the hard, too hard to figure out pile. But um, if, if you read something, um, you know, maybe a spin-off situation or and it's it's complex and you kind of instinctively know most investors uh, will disregard that from the get-go. Maybe that's something that we want to look at, uh, you know, a little deeper. Um, also, like always, inside activity, this has always been a good clue. And I think Googie talked in, in, in his podcast as well about that. You know, um, that, that seems to be a you know, very good indicator. Um, we also like obscure securities generally, you know. Yeah. So if we have some kind of preferred stock that's trading rights, stuff that people just normally don't buy or, or don't like for whatever reasons, uh, something that we that we like to look into um, everything around forced buying and selling is something that you know we would consider um, other special situations that are you know uh, really different are maybe where we have a there's a big difference in what we think what uh, the company is and what the market thinks um, you know you sometimes see geo investing even publishing short reports so we do find situations where we you know we're long researchers and we are uh, you know long investors but every now and then we we find a company that is actually fraudulent um, and we're not afraid to speak out about that mm -hmm. um, so you know some people would consider that sometimes a special situation as well it's not normal shorting you know it's only shorting when we when we find something that is really uh, severe misrepresentation and investor uh, investor abuse right so you know so when i hear special situations from you what's really interesting is that you guys really consider there's not just there's not just a couple different categories you're right. you're, you're you're taking situations where you might say hey there's something just weird going on here and we want to right. investigate further and you guys have the tools to do that correct that, that is, I think that's a very fair assessment. Um, the very nature of our research is that every time it's a little bit different. You know, it doesn't mean that you should, you know, the experience helps you for sure a lot. Mm -hmm. But we try to, uh, you know, approach every situation bottom up, try to understand what's going on. What are What is the incentive of the people involved? What is the incentive and, you know, the motives of the people that are doing something here right now and i think googie talked about that in his podcast as well about you know why people do rights offerings and that kind of stuff right and and, and we think very much along these lines as well mm -hmm. so another question that i had too and i asked i asked googie the same thing and i actually followed his advice and i set up a google alerts for rights offerings you know so <laughs> what 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 are some of the things that you guys do at geo investing to find new ideas or particular different special situations that might come up um that, that's a very very good question i think like the screening part is something that every investor wants to you know improve on um so i got marsh actually um you, you guys probably know marsh he's a very talented investor and a veteran in the industry he's founder of geo investing and he just fills my tray you know so everything marsh looks at a bunch of filings and the people here at the office you know as i said we have 13 people here in the office um and they they just fill my tray with stuff that they see and they say that's weird you know that's hard to figure out we we just put it on him, um, but other than that I think there are good screens out there. Um, Google alerts is something that a lot of people do these days and it's an easy one and and, and effective one. Um, SEC filings, uh, you know you, you got to screen these. Uh, we screen especially for insider filings, you know form four, uh, form four, three and five. Um, Generally speaking, though, I don't believe too much in rigid screening. 
you know, while there is a place for it, what is easy to find is, you know, easy to find and probably a lot of people looked at it already. So unfortunately, I think um, the screening process will involve turning over a lot of rocks. I think uh, yeah. a lot of investors said that before, you know, you got to gotta be willing to look at a lot of situations, disregard most of those, and then really dig into those where you think that, you know, there's an opportunity and stand it thoroughly. Um, the way of, you know, just looking, oftentimes it helps us to just go through, you know, the press releases. Mm -hmm. one by one and just screen through them casually in the you know sometimes in the weekend in the evening mm -hmm. look at what's going on and kind of look at what sparks your interest and then you know dig deeper from there right so what situation in your experience thus far have you seen come up the most you know and you've had to dig deeper and, and turn over a couple rocks um i think the what, what has been a very interest or what we see recently more of is you know the that um, uh, specs special purpose acquisition vehicles mm -hmm. go public you know we have few IPOs of real companies on the Nasdaq but uh, more special purpose acquisition corporations going public mm -hmm. and you know that's basically a blank check company that raises money to acquire a business later and they have a certain time frame and um, these businesses come usually they go public as as a unit so it's not just a, a you know straight common equity but they have something attached to it you know a right oftentimes uh, a warrant um, that has special features, you know, it's um, callable above a certain price that has pro oftentimes a five-year uh, lifetime, which is fairly long. And these very niche sec securities here that are spun off um, when these units separate. So, you know, the, the company goes IPO, the spec goes IPO, and then after some time, the unit that IPO investors get um, separates and you can trade the commons separately from the rights and, and the warrants. And these obscure little securities that are often very illiquid mm -hmm. are something that I think are, are worthwhile looking into for small cap investors, generally speaking, because they give you a quite good risk reward. Um, you also got to, if you do that kind of thing, you always have to consider that uh, investing in, you know, um, derivatives like that, like warrant, uh, is, is very risky. Mm -hmm. You know, if you invest before a, an actual deal happens uh, in a spec uh, and no deal happens, um, you know your warrant will probably expire worthless. Mm. Uh, so it's a danger. It's it's a dangerous game, and you gotta understand what you're getting into. But I think there's plenty of opportunity there, and we see more of it recently. So Siggy, let's let's dig a little deeper into what you just said. You know, uh, in in regards to SPACs. You know, what what are some things that you then look for uh, as a potential investment in this uh, asset class? So when you're looking at SPACs specifically, I think um, you want to look at the terms of the op offering. You know, what does a unit entail in the IPO? You know, is there a, a big warrant kicker or just a small one? What are the terms on that? Uh, you also want to pay a lot of attention, attention to, you know, the people that are behind this uh, vehicle. You know, who is the underwriter? Who is managing the, the, the spec? Who is responsible for um, finding a deal? Um, what is the size of, of, of the spec? You know, um, do, they have, have they, do they have a track record doing it successfully in the past? You know, do you think they have the industry connections to do it well? Because a, a spec, a special purpose acquisition corporation is always about, you know, the the deal, right? You you go IPO, but it's a blank check company that doesn't have an operating business yet. So you put your entire trust into management, um, being able to find a great company to acquire and, and do so successfully. Um, so you, you have to pay a lot of attention to the people and we we track the people that are active in that industry and it's a relatively small industry still uh, we track those people very closely and their track record very closely so we do understand who who's a successful player in the business who has done it before and um, how shareholders fared there mm -hmm. um, the securities that we maybe like best in these situations are not necessarily the common stock although the common stock might be very attractive we think that you know, the warrants that are often uh, coming with it, that kind of deal uh, are very cheaply priced oftentimes, mm -hmm. you know. Right. So if you just, the way that you can test it, for example, is, um, you know, you just plug in the, you know, strike price and the warrant price and, and everything into an option calculator and then you look at the implied volatility and oftentimes you find the, these warrants and these uh, specs to have a very, very low implied volatility, which, w which would imply that these are cheap. Um, and generally speaking, we like to buy stuff that's cheap. Yeah. 
So these these are kind of some of the factors that you want to look at, look at if you're investing into these kind of situations. Right. And when you're looking at SPACs, you know, where do you go and find uh, information on potential new SPACs to invest in? Oh, that that's an easy one. I think the the SPACs you can track fairly easy with uh, just you know tracking IPOs. Mm. Um, you know, they they will they will go public. You know, just can track on Nasdaq fairly easy. You know, go through the list and see what what went public. You know. Um, so that that's an easy one, and then they file offering documents just like normal every every other company uh, that will have details on management and capitalization, you know, all, all all the stuff that you basically require. I don't think it's it's as much a an issue of finding that information as it is an issue of um, knowing what you have to look for mm-hmm. and being able to efficiently find it and digest it in these documents. So. You know, I'm, I might. This might be a, a rather silly, or you know, some of my audience might think it's somewhat of a dumb question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. You know, sometimes when I think of special situations and there are different opportunities out there, sometimes it seems like it's not so much a long game. You know, that it's it's you see it happening, or you expect something might be happening. You found a little, you know, hair in the in the SEC filing, something weird happening. Mm-hmm. And you think, okay, well, maybe this is a short-term opportunity where, you know, I can make, you know, you know, maybe make a little bit on my money, you know, whether it's, a, you know, buying and, and selling, you know, in a short time frame or even just shorting, you know, and, and is, is there that implication, you know, like, do you, how do you feel about that? Um, I think it's, um, it's a little more nuanced than that, but you're generally right. You know, the, these special situations uh, evolve a lot of times around the catalyst. You know, M and A, an activist doing something. Um, so you're right. You know, these, these these situations are probably by tendency a little more short on time horizon and focused on a catalyst. You know, something has to happen. Um, at the same time, you have special situations where uh, you know the time horizon is very long. Mm-hmm. You know, you for example find that. Um, Say we have, we have a situation that we're right now looking into, which is a quite interesting one, where a company that is, um, you know, going public, you know, the parent company is already publicly traded, mm-hmm. and you know the the valuation discrepancy is, is is very big. You know, when this you don't have a firm catalyst of when this is going to be resolved, um, but it's you know we would still book it as a special situation. It's a very obscure situation as well, but the time horizon for this one is long. So we sometimes we're willing to to wait in a special situation for years. Mm-hmm. But I do agree with your general assessment. These these investment uh, the investment thesis in these situations involves oftentimes around the catalyst, and that's just short, more short term in nature. Mm-hmm. It's still fundamental, but it's more short term in nature. Mm-hmm. So you know it, when I've when I've interviewed Maj and and even and, and Chris too, the Raven. Um, we, we've talked about the, you know, there's the going theme at, at geo investing, this idea of, uh, in, information arbitrage, you know, have you seen that theme also carry over into special situations? And then if so, you know, how do you utilize that tool? I think uh, information arbitrage is uh, carrying over into a lot of investment situations and does so with special situations as well. So for example, you know, we would, uh, dig into a filing. And, and then figure out in the very end, you know, that maybe that security that looked very, very interesting on the surface has some features attached to it that make it, you know, probably close to worthless to investors. And that's not well understood because it's explained on footnote 37 on page 300 something. Mm-hmm. Um, but we try to go the extra mile and find these things. And we have, we have encountered situations before where, you know, very, very small details made all the difference in our thesis and basically, um, you know, changed our, our decision from, from, you know, selling to buying and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um, so the devil is in the detail and, you know, so information arbitrage comes into play here. You know, these little information pieces and bits that might be overlooked by the rest of the market is, uh, you know, where you can get your edge. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to shift back to one category of special situation that I'm just curious your opinion on. You know, Talk to me a little bit about spinoffs. You know, what do you look for in these types of situations? I think spinoffs is a quite natural thing to look at um, um, because of you know certain dynamics. It might be you know usually it, it doesn't make sense to to do a spinoff, right? Everybody's talking about hey, if we you know combine these two companies, we're going to save all these costs. So that's kind of counterintuitive to do a spinoff. So there might be other good reasons for doing that. 
and um, you know you've talked on your podcast about uh, that a lot of times before. We don't look a lot at spin-offs. We do look at them, um, but by and large, I I feel that spin-offs are an, a market that is fairly well understood. There's still some forced selling uh, in spin-offs. You know that, for example, shareholders receive uh, shares in you know that company that was now spin spin off that they didn't really want at all. So they're selling it indiscriminately. Yeah. Um, so so that might still make for some opportunity, but we're not looking too much into spin-offs because we feel that, you know, even though we see some opportunities there, they're not as big as they probably used to be. Um, it's a it's a well understood phenomena and I think the market is, is very, very competitive these days. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just tough. You know, we, we look at spin-offs and if we evaluate a spin-off and you ask about that, we'll probably evaluate it like we would evaluate a normal business. Right. You know. And look a little bit more at insider dynamics. Are insiders participating? Do they really want to have a piece of that business here? Are they maybe saving that little gem for themselves? You know, but um, we pay attention to insider dynamics a little more. But other than that, it's like any normal business valuation. Would you want to own that business at that price? Right. Yeah, no, I think Mark was actually hitting on that same point, you know, not not just in regards to spinoffs, but, you know, in some of the more well-known special situations at this point in time, yeah. you know, they're just, it's the, the market's starting to get a little, uh, you know, not not overweighted, so to speak, but just, you know, there's a lot more eyeballs on it, you know, do oh, you, for sure. do, do, would you agree? Uh, I, I do agree. I think the market has become overall more competitive. I think there are multiple aspects that go into that. Um, the trend towards more passive investing is probably... Um, you know, pushed some of the weaker participants overall out of the market. Um, just a, it's, it, it, I think a lot of microcap investors that have a long-term experience will tell you that the game um, got somewhat harder in the most recently years. Mm -hmm. That actually is a perfect segue <laughs> because uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know you recently wrote an article titled "Active versus Passive Investing: uh, What It Means and How Active Managers Can Compete." I think you published it in July, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and around, yeah. around July, yeah. And uh, you know, so for those who don't know, you know, what is that the difference between active and passive investing, and how does this relate to microcap investing? Um, so that's an interesting question. I think the first point to make here is that active versus passive investing is defined differently, and people talk about it differently, you know, in, in different contexts. But what it really means is passive investing is is the idea of tracking a benchmark return rather than trying to achieve something extraordinary. You know, so low costs are a necessity here, you know, and there's a trade-off between replicating your benchmark perfectly and uh, incurring costs in the meantime. So you want to have something that replicates the benchmark well without, you know, incurring big costs. So you get your investors, um, you know, as close to the market return, you know, the given market that you track as possible. In reality, this, this passive investing game is of course more active than it seems you know it's just you know you'll have to make a lot of decisions around what you want to track how you're going to go about tracking it how you're going to rebalance your portfolio all, all these different kind of things which make it you know more complex than just you know in the static model um how it does how it does relate to micro caps in particular is uh, an interesting question but i think a hard one to figure out i think more money being passive does really help deal activity by and large um and fewer companies are just around and fewer companies in the microcap space and fewer companies that are publicly traded overall. Um, I think on the other hand, microcaps might be more attractive for uh, active stock pickers because the microcap space seems to be one of the last places where passive investment is, uh, you know, passive investment strategy is hard to implement. You know, the idea of, uh, you know, if you're, if you're replicating your benchmark and you're basically trying to hold at any given point, you know, every stock in proportion to your portfolio as does the benchmark, mm -hmm. right? So if, you know, the benchmark has 10% of stock A, you want to have 10% and that's shifting around a lot of times and you, you want to, you know, you, you might want to have, you might have to incur a lot of trades in between to replicate that benchmark. Well, you'll have a lot of costs in the microcap space just because trading in and out of positions is more expensive. Um, so that that's a problem for implementing passive investing strategies in the microcap space. And therefore, maybe makes the microcap space uh, more of a stock pickers market um, than any public market that is out there right now. Mm -hmm. So, I, I think it, my my theory is actually that um, by and large, I think more active investment managers and activists as well 
will go kind of down the market capitalization chain and, and we'll look for more opportunities in the small and micro cap space. What investing experience taught you the most and, and shaped your outlook as an investor? Um, so I'll have to admit that the investment experience that probably taught me the most is not even my own investment. <laughs> um, but in the winter of 2008, when the world was going to end, um, my, my dad actually behaved quite quite smartly and invested a lot of money and ever, even leveraged up a little bit. Um, you know, he's a dentist and dentists are really not famous for being great at investing. Um, but at that time, he kept us calm and realized that, um, you know, it's time to, to step up and, and, you know, make a big bet. And that kind of made me understand and taught me, and I hope I'll be ready when the situation comes, that, you know, you have to be, have to be prepared for a big hit, you know, and you have to be prepared to make an uncomfortable but big decision when the time is there. And until then, you position yourself to, you know, be able to act when an opportunity comes. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's what I'm trying to do right now. You know, it's what's funny is I feel like the with every interview, the more and more I, I'm seeing is that you know it seems like a lot of microcap investors they have this natural contrarian mindset. You know, like I feel I have it. You know, it, it's mm-hmm. like one of those things that you just you know you see some bad news and you're like opportunity, good news. Yeah, for sure. Good news. Oh, let's take some money off the table. Why not? You know, it's it's it almost seems like uh, <laughs> over time. The more I talk to everybody, you know, that's a very a, a common thread almost. That's I think that's a it's a good insight and probably probably true. I mean, if you're if you read on the internet what is written about microcap investing, it's not all positive. So you have to be, I guess, a little bit contrarian to give this um, investing space a shot in the first place, right? So then, Siggy, what, what's your advice then for new microcap investors? You know, what are some things they should look out for or, uh, you know, maybe they should be looking for as well? Um, so I think I'll, I'll give you some of the standard advice that everybody will give you and then I'll give you some uh, tips that maybe you haven't heard so often. Um, so the first thing is, of course, read. You know, reading is king. Check out what is out there publicly. So there's a lot of good information on small microcaps out there. On you know, geoinvesting.com publishes a lot of information. Microcap Club. You gotta gotta check out Bobby Kraft's podcast, Planet Microcap. Listen more to that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the the internet is really a gift. I mean, the richest guy in the world forty years ago would have given half his half his fortune just to have that access to information. So really, have a lot of access to information. So read what is what is out there, um, you know. I couldn't agree more with that. At the same time, you know, don't be afraid to to go out and talk to people. You know, like you do basically. You know, don't don't be afraid to to have a conversation with people. And you know, even though you might look foolish sometimes, um, you will grow on it. And you know, so read, get informed, get out there, and and talk to people. Um, I think um, an advice. Uh, that that you don't hear so often is that you, you shouldn't, you know, you have to, if you're starting in investing, and especially, you know, when you're starting off with relatively limited amount of knowledge, you know, because you're just starting off, don't, don't bet the entire farm right away, you know. So look at the money that you can invest permanently, that you can, can commit for a long period of time. Uh, but in order to, to invest comfortably, you, you have to look at your total finances. Uh, in order to make smart decisions in your portfolio, you'll have to make smart decisions in your, you know, in the finances in your, in your entire life. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, look at that from a big picture perspective and um, try to keep some powder dry. You know, if you're a young guy, it's nice to be invested and you, you certainly can take on more risk. But it doesn't mean, you know, you, sh- you shouldn't have any money in your checking account. Right. <laughs> I like that last bit. Yeah, for sure. Wait, so Siggy, before I before I uh, get uh, where people can b- go and find more information, uh, can you provide any sneak previews on any uh, articles that you're working on for geo investing? Um, yes, I can. I think one is actually interesting, especially for the microcap investor. A lot of people have been talking to me about liquidity, um, and there's an article right now in the making. I'm working on that and trying to kind of. Uh, structure my thoughts on the subject and maybe help other people structuring theirs. Yeah. I think a lot of times liquidity and everything around that comes down to price. You know, what price can I get it for? What price can I sell it for? Um, so, so I'm working on an educational article on that side. Uh, another one is actually that I'm working on right now is, is maybe going to be a series of articles 
uh, which I want to call uh, hindsight 2020, talking a little bit about, you know, I just imagine I'm sitting in 2020 and I'm sitting there and the crisis <laughs> hit and my money is gone. So what happened? And I, I already, you know, I, I tried to write an article and I came up with so many different theories that I just decided to, uh, you know, probably make it into a series and, you know, have have diff different editions of the same idea. You know, it's 2020, stock market crashed, I'm at zero. Uh, so what happened? And every time I try to come up with a slightly different theory. So, so I'm working on these, you know, stay tuned. Oh, that's funny. You know, I, I feel like I could do that for hindsight, uh, September 2017, hindsight, <laughs> October 20, or, sorry, August 2017. <laughs> I think every month going back to when I first graduated college. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right. So Siggy, where can uh, our audience go and find more information about you and geo investing? Um, so geo investing is pretty pretty publicly out there. You know you can go to our, to our website geoinvesting.com. You know we have a lot of stuff, educational stuff out there. Uh, we have a membership portal there. You know if you're really looking into looking for due diligence research on small micro cap companies, you know you can subscribe there. Uh, we're active on Twitter as well. You know you you see Marsh out there on Twitter, Quoth the Raven, Chris here from our office is very active there too. Me, me as well. Um, about the short side of the business, you can actually learn by watching a movie. You know, The China Hustle is a movie that uh, was just recently published and it stars uh, Geo Investing. You know, a partner here, Dan David, has a pretty pretty big role in that movie, I understand. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to seeing that being released. So stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. um, and you will also find Geo Investing featured in, you know, the mainstream media, the Wall Street Journal, Barron's. Uh, and proudly planted microcap, of course. <laughs> You're the man. I love it. And uh, <laughs> just for those for those who don't know, what's your uh, Twitter handle? Uh, my Twitter handle is s it is at s g e g g e r t. So it's weird. It's uh, Skigert. It's my name is Siegfried Günther Eggert. So that's where it's coming from. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Very cool. Well, Siggy, I got to say thank you so much for joining us today. It was really a pleasure and uh, I look forward to reading your uh, upcoming articles. Thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in to the Planet Microcap podcast and thank you, Siggy, again for coming on to the program. You can access the podcast by going on to stocknewsnow.com under podcast, go to podbean.com and search Planet Microcap podcast or on iTunes and search Planet Microcap podcast. Stay tuned for the next Planet Microcap podcast where we'll have our next guest to discuss all things microcap. If you have any questions or comments about the podcast, please send an email to info at snnwire.com. I'd love to hear from all of you. This podcast has been brought to you by SNN Incorporated, publishers of stocknewsnow.com, the official microcap news source, and the microcap review magazine. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you again for joining me on the Planet Microcap podcast. Have a great week, everyone.